Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Welcome to our new episode uh, in this uh, Utopia of Hospitality series, web series, okay, brought to you by Boma International Hospitality College. Uh, for today, uh, we have esteemed guests with us, uh, which I will be introducing in a short while. Uh, to begin with, uh, a little information on who we are. Boma International Hospitality College is a premier Pan-African hospitality college offering Swiss hospitality programs in hotel management and culinary arts. Located at the heart of Nairobi, we offer a vibrant and diverse learning opportunity with over 16 nationalities in our student body. Our programs as well include refresher courses and a professional development program with industry placements within the region and around the world. The Utopia of Hospitality is a conversation with frontliners in the midst of the COVID-19 disruption and an opportunity to get insights of what the future holds. I would as well like to uh, formally announce that Boma International Hospitality College is finalizing on preparations to launch a new course in events management. With intakes for the executive certificate in events management currently ongoing and set to start in September of this year. Among our panelists today, we have Mr. Simon Kabu and Chris Kirua. Uh, briefly, I will uh, introduce the two of them. Uh, just to let you know, Mr. Simon Kabu, uh, a uh, bachelor's in economics, okay, and statistics graduate from Egerton University, is the CEO and founder of Kenya's largest and one of Af Africa's leading two operator or two operating companies, uh, Bonfire Adventures. Okay. Simon has worked for Ungal Limited as an account manager and also worked as a matatu tout on Route 44. He says integrity will enable you to get repeat clients and, re and referrals while patients will chase away the spirit of expecting results overnight. Mr. Chris Kirwa okay, is a distinguished events organizer, MC, as well as a top-notch event security expert. Before that, he was the brand manager for Rangers Restaurant and has organized several beauty pageants countrywide. He started off his career in media at KBC and Metro TV and has been in the entertainment industry for over 20 years now. Uh, now, if I may start with you, Chris, I hope I got your um, uh, short bio accurate and correct. Maybe yes. if you'd like to add a little bit more on who you are so we can know uh, who we're dealing with. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, um, we, I, we run a company called Kate Chris Limited with my wife. Obviously, prior to that, we... I had worked for several other agencies, including uh, EXP. Uh, actually, ran a, two, three restaurants, uh, Rangers Restaurant. At some point, uh, started a club somewhere in town. Um, so it's been it's like accumulation of experience uh, of of events that obviously now in an event uh, scenario you get to meet almost everybody from, and I'm happy you're speaking about hospitality today because uh, hospitality is key in our events because people come to socialize, but of course uh, they have to enjoy their food and drinks, f and as they call it. So that's what, that's what, that's where we come from. So, uh, yes. Great. Thank you very much. Simon, maybe you could tell us a little bit, you look like you're on an excursion or something. Where are you calling us from? <laughs> Uh, thanks, Alan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am sub to move up from Nairobi to go and check around to see how how hotels and if everyone is is complying to these things of uh, of of COVID. Uh, my name is uh, Simon Kabu, as you have been told. I am the chairman, and the CEO of Bonfire Adventures, and I have come from very very way far. Uh, yes, I have been uh, 
uh, tout at Route 44. I, 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 that's how I, I use that money of being a tout to cater for my university education at Egerton University. After that, I went to employment in FMCG, that is uh, fast moving consumer goods in milk industry, where I used to work like 18 hours in a day. After that, at least uh, I, 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 I was promoted due to my the passion, the, the good work. I was promoted to uh, to be a, a, a supervisor. Of, that is from Brookside. Went to Tuzo. Then after that, we we uh, went to to that at least uh, opportunity by by fate and. Uh, the default where our friends wanted to travel we said why can't we, we were in a group we said why can't we why, why, why can't we do a, a, a team, team building then we were told guys who want to volunteer to organize i was among the volunteer plus my wife now sarah who used to be my friend then then after that uh, we were to organize. We went to Lukenya. It was very successful. We posted photos on on FB. The guys who didn't attend said we want to attend. We were to the same guys who organized the first one, organized the second one. That's how again we started charging and Bonfire Adventures was born. Yes. Alan, great. Yeah, yes, there's a very inspiring story. Thank you very much. Maybe you could just give us a brief indication. How long did it take you? from the point where you thought or, or, or you had the idea that you could come up with Bonfire Adventures until where you uh, you, you arrived at or where you are right now? Uh, uh, yes, it has been uh, 10 years of hard work. And it, it just uh, started, I had, I had not trained in, 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 in tourism. I wish I was because I could have done things better because the mistakes that I did when I was starting, maybe I could not have uh, done those mistakes. Uh, in 2007, December 1st, that's the time we, we did the first team building at Lukenya. And we put the photos on Facebook then. Unfortunately, something happened. Uh, there, there was a the, the post election at that particular time. Then after that, uh, we said, uh, because in in April, around April there, we said, why can't we, because there had been some fights here and there, why can't we do another another team building just to heal and, 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 and because, people, because we are people from different uh, parties? Then we were to the guys who were going to uh, something to uh, Naivasha, and people were, were very happy to... Among us, the people who are there, there were some corporate people. One person asked us, can you do team building? I said, yes, why not? The, because where I was, where I was working, I had seen uh, us do some team building. So I, then uh, asked us, that time the other people that we were organizing with had fallen on the way. So uh, they asked, we, we, I, I remember we charged 30,000 30, Kenya shilling and they asked us, where do we pay? I thought they would, I thought they would pay us through M-Pesa. So they said, no, 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 we are corporate, we cannot pay through M-Pesa. So they told us you have to open, uh, you have to open a bank account, a company bank account. We didn't have a company. So we had to, to search for, for a name. And that part, uh, I remember we were in Masai Mara with Sarah, trying to check who we were not even dating. We were just friends and we were just organizing. Then we, we, we uh, then that time <laughs> Sarah asked us, what makes us come, can make us come back to Masai Mara? We said, this, because there was a, a, a bonfire there, we said Bonfire Adventures. And that's how the name was coined. Then we went uh, 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 the company name and size the company for around three months without banking it because the protocols opening an account. Fast forward, uh, we, we did have an office and uh, we just had, I had a relative who had a desk in town. So uh, our house and th that's the desk that we used to, I, I, I requested him because he was not using it and we paid 10,000. That was our startup capital. Then after that, many people started now asking us, where else do we go? No, we started exploring and traveling and now taking our friends with us. And that's how the company was born. Fast forward, we didn't have a staff. Uh, we we, we, we looked for one intern to keep there because we were working in different places. And right now, 
uh, 10 years down the line, we have over 300 uh, permanent staff and another like 300 or 400 who who, who work with us, uh, driver guides, uh, tour guides, uh, excursion people. across and we have the world alan all right thank you thank you very much uh, i've got a question here that has come in and i'd like to 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 ask this question to both of you so we are now dealing with this uh pandemic situation okay it has brought a lot of things to almost a standstill or, or a stop do you enlighten us, how has this pandemic affected you so far in your respective sector? I'll start with you, Chris. Um, immediately, COVID started in uh, China um, because in, in our events industry, you have to keep on researching to find out what's happening. And because as an agency, an events agency, we are big on safety and security. So uh, it, it it caught our attention. So we started just, you know, um, you know, researching and finding out what's happening and its impact because at the end of the day, um, any small thing can affect a big gathering or, or people in an event setup. Then you need to be aware and what mitigation measures you need to do to be able to survive it. So um, by the time now it was hitting January, February, we realized that things now are going to be bad because our clients started, of course, getting worried, and especially international clients who would naturally fly in to come for either a seminar, uh, a conference, or even those that are sponsoring uh, uh, an event uh, right here in Kenya. So the month of uh, January and February up to March is what we call a team building phase, uh, where companies now come together and they want to re-strategize and plan for the year, you know, get the staff together to, 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 to get them into the uh, vision and the new way of working and to discuss what they did the previous year, how, what they can do better. So uh, certain companies call it kickoff, where you can actually take all your staff to, they, they can take them to Boma Eldoret, for example, and they book the entire place for, for five days. And they're not doing anything else but talking and discussing and how to win better than what they did. That was the first phase that was canceled. So immediately that was canceled. Then of course the presidential announcement came where now zero events were going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I remember uh, we were in a retreat in, in, in Naivasha at uh, LNR. And at the parking lot, I think there were over 200 cars. When I woke up in the morning, it was only my car in the parking. As in Everybody literally on Sunday left uh, for for Nairobi. So yeah, that was uh, that's you know not, has it ever hit you so hard that one minute as 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 an events person as a hospitality venue you have guests and in two three hours you can find yourself alone. So and then um, I had to still stay there because we were doing. There was a retreat we are doing uh, with TRA, that's the Tourism Regulation Authority, and because we had already arranged to meet to craft um, uh, crafting some safety protocols and what needs to be done to just enhance the industry better, both at hospitality level and at event level. So we were there, and then of course, after some time also, we had now to come back to Nairobi because there was uh, the closure. Uh, the, of, of metropolitan. Uh, so the one thing you don't want is to be locked out of, of Nairobi <laughs> and, and wonder how to come back. By then now, all clients now, of course, there was no event. So you you now, because um, like Simon was saying, he, he has like 300 people permanent because of our nature of event. We don't have a lot of permanent people. What we have is a lot of people on short-term contracts. So if I have two events in a month, then I'll give people contracts of one week, two weeks, because a lot of them are, um, are set up people, what we call roadies in technical terms, because they're the ones loading gear and you know hoisting stuff, uh, assisting the suppliers to work. So those guys were the first hit. They are the first ones to get hit because this guy rely on 
immediately after an event, you pay them. Then um, we, you, we, we were thinking maybe it's a temporary thing, maybe a month or two. Then we go back. Yes. Uh, we are in June and we've not done a single event since then. And this applies then, of course, to across the board, to everyone across, across the world. And the problem with COVID-19, unlike any other challenge uh, that we've ever experienced in our events industry, is that maybe during uh, the post-election um, crisis in Kenya, it was just in Kenya. Meaning if we guys stabilized, it meant the, the rest of the world will have confidence to come back and do what they need to do with us in terms of uh, giving us an opportunity to host their events, giving Simon Cabo and his uh, company uh, a chance to tour the country. But now it's the entire world. So it's, it's, even if you, you, are, you are successful, I'm, I'm hearing New Zealand have zero cases or something like that, but nobody's going in. So at least they can travel within the country, but the way the world is set up now is that we rely on each other. We rely on business from across the border. So yeah. all that now is at a freezing, uh, it's frozen, nothing has happened. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Simon, uh, maybe you could tell us um, how has this uh, situation, this pandemic situation affected you and your sector? Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, COVID nineteen, I think it's 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 the uh, okay the best and the worst thing that has ever happened to our industry. First, saying the 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 best is because there's so much that we have learned from it, which maybe we could not have learned. Mm -hmm. This will never be the same again for everyone. Secondly, the worst because um, uh, the hospitality industry is the worst hit sector in the world. What does that mean? Uh, when other industry started uh, getting the effect of COVID maybe in March. As we, we got that maybe in January and, and early January, um, uh, late Jan and Feb. Uh, like, like, like now, uh, we, we normally have a lot of Chinese uh, tourists who come to Kenya uh, during the Chinese New Year, which happens in mid-January. Mid this year, there were still some cases of COVID, so it didn't happen. So they didn't, they had already paid, we had paid the hotels and we had paid for transport. So this year, they didn't come. What happened is that they said, we are not traveling. Guys, there's, there's, uh, there's uh, something has happened to our, our country. Because we thought it was a Chinese disease. That's at first, that's what we thought. We didn't know that it will affect us at all. And we said, it's okay. You guys, when you are ready to travel, they said, no, 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 we need the refund. We had paid the hotel, we had paid the transport, so we had to refund them and the hotels and um, the hotels and, and the transport and the airlines didn't think it was an, it was a big issue at that particular time that would warrant even any refund. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we normally have uh, Kenyans who travel to Dubai between Jan and Feb to go for Dubai shopping festival. It's a big number and we do it in, 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 in big numbers. This year, they didn't travel because that's the time now people were contemplating there's some disease somewhere. So there are some lockdowns here and there. So the Dubai Shopping Festival didn't happen. Uh, in April, we normally have Easter, which is a big, big, big uh, day for us. That week, it's, it's big. We us, especially us because we're the biggest promoter of, of, of domestic tourism in Kenya, where we charter flights to Dubai, we charter flights to Mombasa from Nairobi, Kisumu, Eldoret, charter, uh, bonfire charters, which 100% they are only bonfire clients. And we already started doing that. And we, we, we normally handle between 10,000 to 12,000 people that one particular day over Easter. Uh, this Easter, we had zero, that is nil client. So if you if you if you check from uh, Feb or March, Feb, April, May, June, and now, now we are going to June and, and, and July. That's four months. That, that is one third of a year, which we have not worked at all. Yeah. What we are trying to do right now is just to handle like uh, the people because first we we we, we are not working because uh, the the skies are closed. Uh, Second, the hotels are closed. And most of our clients who had paid, 
some have lost their jobs, some have, have, have they, they are on, 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 on half cuts and all that. Some are coming to us to, uh, to tell us, guys, now I cannot afford to travel anymore. We had paid the hotels, we had paid the airlines, had it per cent for on behalf of that client. And client are saying, guys, will I die? You know, we are trying to talk to them and tell them, guys, you can travel later. But uh, the cash refunds we are not we are not getting from airlines and the hotel, and that is the biggest challenge that we're having as a tours and travel company. When airlines uh, give us uh, uh, put the, the ticket to be open, you can travel later, and hotels give us a, a credit note as opposed to the client who need the liquid cash to survive, which uh, the client is yeah. is talking to us now directly is our client. That's the challenge that we are facing. Some are trying to tell them, guys, we're not able to refund because we, the money is with the hotel or it's with, with, with the airline. You can only do this. And we are showing, uh, we are giving the emails and what, and we are giving them the official credit that you have got from the hotel. So I, I think uh, uh, from that, the effect has been where, uh, like now myself, I have over nine offices. The, all the offices are closed at this particular time. We are trying to work from home for those uh, the, the small number of staffs who can be able to we can be able to accommodate the small because the best right now what we are doing is just Nairobi National Park and the hotels that are within Nairobi because most of our clients come from Nairobi so we are trying to to work within that because now of the succession that has been done to go out of of the of the of of Nairobi so Alan yeah Thank you very much. Well, if you say that uh, that everyone is working from home, uh, I can commend you for the very good work they're doing because uh, I I follow you on Instagram and every single day I have an update about what what Bonfire is doing. So 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 it's good to to uh, to see that uh, there's, there's continuity despite the whole uh, uh, the whole situation. Now we've had several industry players that we invited to this series and they drew comparisons uh, in, 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 in how it is that they dealt or they have dealt with this situation so far. And they drew comparisons with how similar pandemics like the Spanish flu and, 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 and the plague that happened uh, back in history and, and how it is that the COVID-19 pandemic is different than what they have done so far. In your sectors, how how is it that that, that you had prepared yourself for an eventual or or, or 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 a potential pandemic situation like this one? I'll start with you, Chris. Um, the truth, <laughs> Spanish <laughs> Spanish flu happened a hundred years ago. Um, yeah. I'm sure both of us, me, you, and Simon, and everybody probably watching were not around. So in terms of uh, when we are approaching an event, we do what we call um, a risk assessment. And out of the risk assessment document that now covers um, everything from food to either stampede to fire breaking out in an event venue uh, during uh, transport to a particular venue, should an accident happen, what do you do? Um, so we work with, uh, with, with, with your sister uh, company, uh, E Plus, a lot. Um, we've actually even had trainings at uh, BOMA, at your hotel, and all of them were short term. They were not trainings for a pandemic of yeah. the magnitude of COVID. So we will, we will plan and say, should this happen, this is what we will do. Um, how do we deploy um, paramedics? How do we deploy security? Um, I think du during um, du during the Al Shabaab attacks, we nearly reached where we are. Where now we had to do some serious, and I'm sure Simon will speak about this too. We had to do some serious uh, security. Where now you vet everybody coming in, you introduce measures to to just make sure somebody that is driving with a vehicle and probably blow you up or somebody sneaks in. So, but it wasn't to the level of COVID where now, first and foremost, for the first time in my life, I have stayed in Nairobi since, since March, not traveling outside. I'm just here. Um, you, you want to travel now, you have to get some serious documentation. So I think everybody is trying to adapt quickly, learn quickly, 
and see how they can survive and try and see what is the foreseeable future where um, we, uh, we, we stay next to the airport. It's, it's so strange to, to have an, a silence at the airport, as in yeah. airports are not supposed to be silent. You, you're supposed to hear planes landing and taking off, and that I'm sure will make Simon very happy and some of us. But it's now further. So I, I can't say we were prepared. So obviously we now went into what a war room because now COVID is an enemy, so you have to fight. So we've uh, under our chair um, who leads Zimak, and we were we were called, we, we were brought in to come and draft the safety protocols, and that has been going in uh, the private sector in partnership with government, uh, led by the CS uh, Tourism and and all the other parastatos, and of course all the other government agencies to be able to draft the safety protocols that will guide how now we approach the future because at some point we really need to open up and try and survive it. So the same way um, the, the people who were always ahead of this is you as hospitality industry because you understood that um, something called food poisoning cannot be happening in an event. So sometimes you will tell us things as event managers or as just general public and you find people are not listening You'll try and tell people, okay, just wash your hands before you approach the buffet station. Some people will just want to hit it without necessarily bothering. But right now, everybody is so careful because the reality is hitting us. So the reaction across the world, and it's unfortunate that some countries took longer to acknowledge that this pandemic was real and they paid um, with people's lives, which is wrong. So those who closed, and I'm happy with what the I personally support what the government is doing, because we rather first of all hold and then say, how do we approach? You saw in the army, if, if the enemy is attacking uh, Kenya, they don't wake up and rush to the border. They actually sit down. You rather plan, 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 so that when you approach, even if they've advanced all the way to Eldoret, it will be a precise uh, counterattack that can drive them away. But if you just rush, you'll all be you know, killed. So that's, that's the attitude we all need to approach and support. And, and it starts at a personal level. What, what have you been doing that you need, you need to change to be able to protect the next person? Yeah, so it's, uh, I can't say we, we had a real good plan of how to survive COVID. Uh, anybody saying that will be lying. We, we didn't know. Yeah. yeah, true, true. What about for you, Simon? <laughs> Uh, as Chris has said, yes, no one was prepared for this. Even if we 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 knew there was uh, there was something in our problem, I remember uh, February 14th I taken for Valentine, and I remember making a joke, seeing a Chinese a Chinese at the airport at the the the, the business class lobby, Victoria Falls, and I was saying I don't want to stay near there because I don't want to get Corona. So and everything was happening as normal. One month down the line after February 14th, because I think I left there at around uh, February 20 something, 23rd or 24th. So three weeks after that, the Kenya as a country was on <laughs> lockdown. So uh, one thing we were not at all even anticipating that something would ever close borders. We didn't think that this would happen in this world, in this age and, and era. We didn't think uh, that would happen. But this thing has taught us a lot of things. One is that. Um, Something so small, without being, without uh, precautions being uh, taken care of, can can close the whole world. Some countries that we thought were very big and very prepared, we thought we have seen uh, otherwise, and we have just uh, we have just seen that some few things, some small things like washing your hands can be able to be uh, something that is used to fight a very big thing. You know, health wise, uh, we we have started to rethink our strategies, our priorities across the board how we handle our uh, business, how we handle day-to-day -day, uh, life. We are considering that and thinking now our priorities have changed. But all that said is that um, 
um, I know hospitality will change because uh, where I have gone to, now I'm very cautious of what is the distance that I'm keeping from a stranger. Uh, if, if I go to a, uh, some, some, somewhere like a, a restaurant, I, I check, do I, is, is, are, they, are, are they compliant of whatever I know? I, I, I know there's a lot of information going around, but uh, I'm able to check and see, are they, uh, are the social distance be, being maintained? Are people washing their hands? Are people putting on their masks? Are, are the masks being put correctly? You know, all that I'm, I'm, I'm now conscious about. And what we have done like now, when we are taking people to Nairobi National, I know ministry has, has given some guidelines, it not maybe well, well established and all that, but there are those that, as a person, we already know that our vehicles need to have sanitizers, our vehicles need to be sanitized and washed at this particular time. Uh, we need, I assume before that we were having eight people eight people and now we can only have six people aboard there uh, the vehicles or seven people or we you know all those things now we are, we are doing them our clients we cannot allow them to be in the vehicle without uh, uh without masks uh we are not uh, before that we are doing something we call group joining where we are joining people who are strangers but now we are not doing it it's either you are one family or you come as a group which yeah, maybe we are calling them uh, quarantine squad, where the people that you quarantine with, then we can be able to take you, but not join a person A and a person B. Uh, we hear when things open up, the flights will be different. Uh, maybe assume the flights were, were, were carrying 320 people, maybe it will carry 180. So it means maybe the cost of flights will go up. We are at least preparing our clients that things will go up but one thing i like to say is that uh, even the hotels that uh, i have visited uh, right now uh, because the hotels that are open at least we are, we are visiting to see uh, before we sell a hotel we are visiting them like, like uh, uh, last week uh, I, I was at one hotel at nairobi national park to check the compliance because i don't want to take my clients somewhere then uh, their heads will be we uh, will be compromised. So when when we go there, I check: are they doing what is right according to the to the standards, the SOPs that we have given by the by, by the by the Ministry of Health? Uh, and I've seen I've seen some people. Yes, uh, people are trying, and eventually I think we, this would be the new normal that we'll be able to establish. Our hotels, uh, the the dining if hotels were doing. Dinings, a hundred people. You now they, they they may be today twenty five or fifty, and do it in shifts. All those things are things that we're exploring as this industry. But I would urge the uh, the all of us, including the the Minister of Tourism, Minister of Health, and all the stakeholders, to come up with clear guidance and SOPs that everyone will know that when you go to this hotel, you expect A, B, and C. So if it, if it's not there, you're able to report. Maybe maybe uh, uh, maybe we, we have a toll free number. Were you able to report this hotel A, B, and C? You guys said uh, there should be a bit senior, uh, the distance that we're able to keep this disease at bay. Alan? All right. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, Chris, there's a, there's a question here that has uh, come through. Um, yes. Will emergency response preparedness change at events uh, post pandemic? And if so, how will emergency response uh, preparedness change? It will change 100%. Um, one, it's going to be item number one in a checklist of events. Obviously, item number one has always been either food and beverage, uh, probably the extra curriculum activities that will happen in that event. So you find that maybe a lot of resources have normally been allocated to that. But this time around, risk assessment, safety, and even security will be item number one. So um, if we, let me use an example of a conference happening at uh, Boma Hotel. Normally, maybe you'll have, let's say, 500 people, as Simon was saying. So I'll walk in, and then the first person I want to meet is not even the general manager or f &B manager, I want to meet the head of safety. And you'll have a meeting with your head of safety first. And then 
we will go through the guidelines, we'll go through the safety protocols, both what the government has recommended, what you as a, as a hotel has recommended, and then what we guys have. Then once we've set that up, then now we call all the seniors um, uh, within ourselves, within me as an events agency, client side and yourself. Then we go through them and agree and append our signatures. Then now we call a staff meeting for all the stuff, including our side, client side, and what needs to be done. Then from there now we say, okay, guys, we cannot be able to have 300. We'll only be able to have, I'm just giving a scenario, we'll only be able to have 100. Then the rest of the participants who are supposed to be here, they will join this uh, meeting via webinar uh, series like yours. Now, uh, that is where now people start getting angry because I really want to come to this because we are human beings. We love social interactions. Um, but as Simon says now, the, 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 the mixing of people that you have no clue where they've come from is not going to happen. So you can imagine if somebody is flying in, Simon has flown them in through Bonfire and we guys now are receiving them as event managers to take them to this destination. They have to go through uh, the safety checks in terms of checking their temperatures. So yeah. the other day I was even wondering, so if you want to come to uh, a seminar in, in Nairobi, so do you, do you do the test at your place 14 days prior? So you get the results and those results now are shared with a venue like yourself, shared with a transport agency, shared with an events agency like ours at Kate Chris Limited. Before now you come in, you can imagine. So once these guys are already here, the biggest uh, number of people that will be working at your venue are not your service teams, are not my events people, the technical, but the people who will be monitoring people to ensure they are following the safety protocol. So the number of staff that we will need to deploy to ensure that people do not relax and not observe the safety protocols will be more. So even now when they are boarding those vehicles trying to head somewhere, you know how it is with human beings. You tell them it's eight parks or is it six parks? But somebody wants to join his friend in that place. They are already in this venue. You tell them now you have to maintain 1.5 uh, meter social distancing before we clear you and accredit you. They want to handle together like four of them and catch up and do high fives and you know, hugs. So you see, we are there busy monitoring to make sure these human beings do not do that. But just like safety, uh, security um, checks have always been resisted because you will see somebody walking into a shopping mall and when they are stopped to be checked, you see them frown, you see them getting annoyed and looking at this security officer like, why are you bothering me? But people forget they're actually doing it for you to make sure everybody that is entering that place is not going to cause harm to anybody else. So there are some companies, and I think I was saying Safaricom, where they actually have their own armed security in their shops, where they actually, they are ready in case something happens, they can evacuate all their employees out of that place very fast. So you can imagine how much money that is before the terror attacks. So now you're adding another called COVID. You know, COVID is the worst terrorist, I think, that uh, has ever hit us because it's made all of us uniform. So there will be a lot of that. Um, the other, uh, uh, I think I was thinking, suppose I'm hosting a concert. Now this concert, I've always had one stage. I've always had a backstage where I can accommodate one or two, three artists and they don't mind because they know each other. <clears throat> but right now everybody has to be in their own cubicle. This moderator, this key speaker, He's speaking at Boma, um, I think Nyeri. I think you guys have a, a facility there. So now I have to have his own cubicle. He cannot share things with anybody else. My gear, the equipment we have at Kate Chris, everybody has to have their own microphone. There is no sharing. So everything has to be doubled. Now, if you're hosting a concert, for example, then I have to have two stages. So it means stage one is alive. And when that performance has ended, I close it down, I sanitize it as stage B takes over. So you can imagine it's, it's duplication of everything, but with less numbers, like Simon said, in airlines. So the cost might be more. 
to be able to accommodate because if you are hosting 10,000 people, I can easily charge those guys 500 uh, Kenya shillings to come for the concert. But now the safety protocols are telling me 10,000 has been reduced to 2,000 people. When 2,000 is too much, let's assume 1,000. So how do you now still have an event like that? And in, in a consumer journey, based from a brand perspective, I want to have so many people at BOMA to be able to, for them to sample and have an experience about this product that we are launching. And sometimes it's even themed through the food and drinks that we are serving in that event. But now with the social, uh, with, the, with COVID, it means you, you can't, I don't think you can even, I don't, I don't know how buffets will work. That maybe you can tell us, how do we now have, because we don't want everybody touching the scooping spoon. So maybe you need to deploy more staff, more uh, stations, and then nobody is touching anything. And you, the glass you use once you, I, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a bit crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Now, um, um, in terms of we 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 are an educational institution. Okay. Now um, we are here to ensure that, that that people are prepared for the industry. Okay. What message would you have for for people who'd like to get into this industry that maybe had an interest before? Okay. And now they're going through this. What what do you think they need to do in order to prepare themselves themselves for a career in events or in, in the tourism industry? I'll start with you, Simon. Uh, uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, I think it's not the time to say that we'll be out of this uh, sector. Uh, as we are saying, like, like, like you know, something like buffet, what was happening, we maybe a hotel required uh, may, maybe like two or three serving people when we are doing buffet. Right now, we might require 20, depending on the now, because buffet might not be where the client is serving themselves. It, it might be where a, a hotel staff now serves you. You see, we still require more staff. In fact, after this COVID, there'll be more human resources in tourism and hospitality sector than before because as you had chris say there'll be two stages so you need two people to manage that um mm. there'll be a lot of duplication where uh you might find that, like swimming pools maybe there are two after this uh, uh, maybe today we use this tomorrow we use you know such, such like so we require more stuff even if the digital part of it uh, will still go digital and, in, and and reduce the interaction part uh, some yeah. some works need to need, need to be done by by actual staff. So and again, as long as they they might uh, there might not be a lot of uh, uh, interactions. Uh, people now are hungry to travel. They are, so people have changed their their priorities. There's, I remember there are some clients who I talk to right now. They tell me, Simon, I want to travel because I know I could have I, this corona could have uh, could have gone with me. Now it's my time to travel the world. You know, it's it's not, it's it's not an issue of you just uh, just now doing a lot of things, becoming happy and, and doing that. The bucket list part of it, it's among the priorities that now people are thinking about. Because people have seen you can be healthy today, and after some time you are not healthy and you are not even you're even gone. So I think hospitality is it's something that. Uh, we will. Uh, I have seen the, the the results where most of the people, uh, according to the, what they are saying about the, the results, most of the people who are passing on could be having uh, a condition and and uh, a pre-existing condition and high blood pressure and and, and, and diabetes. Uh, uh, they are saying that that's uh, one of that. And one of the things to reduce those people is traveling. Holiday is one of the things that, that makes you not see doctor so often. It's proven because you, you don't get more stress. You see a lot of things out of the world. You reduce the stress as you, you holiday. So I think that's among one of the uh, one among of the therapies that I think we need to use to everyone so, so that they are able. So we need to increase the impact on uh, that will be increase the impact on uh, 
on, on hospitality. So those people who wanted still to be hospitality, it's high time and they perfect it. But what we, we I just need to tell people that there'll be, there'll be issues of safety and security of the client, health, safety, and security of the client will be will be paramount. Maybe there are some other courses that people can can do. Maybe first aid, maybe nutrition, all, all those things that can be able to accommodate whatever is they have done in quality. Alan. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Over to you, Chris. I totally agree with Simon. This is not the time to talk about. Uh, now dropping this career and saying, you know, I don't think the events industry is working. I don't think uh, uh, tourism, hospitality, and travel is not working. It's the time actually where you need, like he says, more people on it because the future of, of COVID is a vaccine that will now enable some all of us to, to deal with it the way we've dealt with any other, whether smallpox, whether you know, polio. So before we reach there, we cannot now give up life and say now we are now going not shutting down hotels. We are shutting down events, venues, no way. It's now for us to adapt and to be to, to increase our level of uh, safety and, uh, and hygiene levels and to, to all be compliant to the recommended and researched um, uh, measures that can ensure that we are safe. So we will have to employ more people to do a simple event. I think more planes will need to fly people because if 320 people have always flown to Dubai to go and attend a concert that we guys are managing, it means maybe there will be three more planes. That's mm -hmm. more, more work for the airlines. That's more work for the events industry. And uh, as Simon said, people come to social events. Let, let's take, for example, um, conference tourism. So people, when, when you're told you're going to attend a conference in Switzerland, the, the home of hospitality where you guys, uh, I think, uh, draw your, your expertise from, I am very excited because I, I learned about Switzerland well, while I was in high school. It's, um, it's geography. So... I'll be so excited. Yes, I'm going for this conference, but I'm so excited on the social part of it where they will take us to the Alps. They will go show us how they do their stuff. So you can imagine. And in the process, if I had um, stress levels that were, were escalating, whichever pre-existing um, conditions I have, they will be reduced. So people attend events, people travel, people holiday, to be able to, uh, in, in Kiswahili, they say, uh, meaning you, 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 you excel, you relax your mind. When the mind is relaxed and you eat great food and hopefully do some exercise, we rarely do exercise when we are in, on holiday. We, we tend to get a bit fat because of the good food. But that's, that's what life is all about. People work so hard and they book a holiday or work so hard and hope they will be selected to attend this conference. And where they attend that conference, uh, there is a day they will be let out and they will go to these big shopping malls. They will shop for their families, great things. They will take pictures and share. And then they will inspire someone else to want to travel. And that's what life is all about. We cannot say we will shut down. We are not shutting yeah. down. We will have to win. We will have to win together because now this is about us, all of us working together. Great, thank you very much. Simon, do you think there will be a resistance from Kenyans to travel abroad, for example, to Dubai or to China uh, because of this pandemic? And if so, how can you as Bonfire Adventures navigate past this resistance of traveling ab uh, abroad? Uh, I, I think uh, it will just take a some time uh, what happens is as everyone is predicting that domestic tourism will uh, we, 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 we recover fast which is true because uh, the, the known is better than unknown because you can see when you try within the 
the country, you're able to see how many people are there, which location has what, it's, there's none. So it means even right now, people are ready when it's opened up uh, to travel in the country. Um, people might, some people might shy, a little bit shy off to travel abroad, but depending on what measures that airlines and the countries abroad will take, it, it might take a longer time, but eventually it will open up and we forget that. You know, it's like the way sometimes one, uh, there's a road, maybe assume there's a road that, that had a lot of potholes. Uh, it, was, it was very, very, to navigate was, was very hard. After that road is tarmacked, you normally forget that there are potholes at one particular time. The same case is that human might forget very fast, and depending on the situations that uh, the, the uh, whatever uh, the other countries uh, will, the measures that they will take, that will determine whether people might for, uh, might not be ready right now to travel to China. But after a year or two, you'll find very many people traveling to China as normal. The same case applies to somewhere like so some countries have even fewer cases than us. So I, I, I remember there's the same, yes. So I, I think with time, people will be able to travel and and forget that there was COVID, depending on the measures that, that are there and how the hotels and airlines and events uh, organizations that are there will be able to handle that. Alan? Great. Thank you very much, Samuel. Now, uh, for us as an educational institution, what can we do, okay? What can we do in order to assist you in your sector uh, going forward in, in tackling this, this, this difficult situation? I'll start with you, Chris. Um, you, you are a call to our events. You are a call to our travels because once people attend my event, the first thing they will want is to head somewhere where they'll get their drink. And once they've gotten their drink, uh, the next thing they want is good food. Once they've eaten good food, now they are ready for either the conference or the team building or for the entertainment lined up. So you as, a, and I'm happy, first and foremost, even this webinar in itself is one way of now, because this will be shared, a lot of people will be able to watch this. We are giving great experiences based on our events industry and on hospitality and on travel. So um, we, we expect the following from you. Um, you to come on board and tell us, okay, I'm having this event of 1,000 people. How can we make sure that our clients, because they are all our clients, they are going to come and experience either the concert uh, the entertainment that is there and they're going to travel back home safely and we will not be um, case number something where people attended our event and now we are being named as you know everybody attended this event and this is where they all got sick from so we will need to work together I was looking at a scenario where we might now start um, looking at um, more of packed food you see the way they will give you your packed food in an airline so it's already packed uh so like you guys i know because i've worked with you guys so you have your you have your um, mobile uh, catering trucks uh, i think you have one in eldoret and you have one in nairobi I, I know a bit about you because i've worked with you guys so um so that that will work so instead of you bringing me the buffets that you normally bring you will have pre-packed the food and then everybody is picking their food so there is, zero, there is very limited interaction. So I see a lot of that. I see um, um, more stuff from your side. I remember when, um, when we had uh, World Youth Under 18 Championships at Kasarani, we were involved on the digital, one of our clients had given us digital work to be able to drive people. And I think we did an amazing job. We had almost 50,000 people attending to watch the games. And then because I'm from the events industry, I was keenly observing the safety uh, requirements that were happening. For some reason, during that time, we had cholera. During that time, we had cholera. So the levels of hygiene in my entire life, I think after that, I started experiencing them in COVID. 
So two years down the line, I started experiencing them in COVID because I will see a service team member carrying food and they will be stopped randomly and checks are done on them. And if they think this person doesn't look okay, they will pick that food, throw it away, take away the, the service team member and go and you know quarantine them somewhere briefly to just because it was cholera time. So you have all these countries that are attending these games from all over. Can you imagine them getting sick in Kenya? We will we will be shut down as, as, as a country in terms of guys who don't seem to know what we are doing. So I think through that process that we, we did, um, and I saw it being done during that time, are the same measures that we need to approach COVID with, where we are so careful from the time this um, conference, concert, team building attendee is leaving and is being transported and is arriving and is being accommodated, the measures have to be in place completely as you as a venue and as a catering team. So our staff, both yours, ours and Simon's have to be trained at the highest level possible and to keep reminding our clients, keep reminding the attendees that one slip, one mistake and we are all done because it takes one. It takes one person not observing or, or, or asleep and we are all infected. So a lot of sanitization will need to happen. A lot of, because people now are saying, let's open up the country. This Corona thing doesn't look right, but I don't think we need to learn the hard way. So uh, like I said, I support the, the Ministry of Health um, recommendation and what they are doing and all the other stakeholders like yourself and ourselves. It's painful. It's costing us business, of course, but we would rather be alive, uh, a bit broke, but safe than just throw open our doors and then there we are. So we, 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 we are happy with, because as, um, as BOMA, B-I-H-C, you guys are already in the forefront of training and I've attended even, I've even come to your classes and seen what you guys are doing. And I'm happy that you're standing at events uh, uh, training and we hope to be able to collaborate together as Kate, Chris and you to be able to share our experience because we will come and share. You know, we didn't, we, some of us, like someone said, we, we didn't train for what we are doing. Even me, if you ask me that I have yeah. a certificate in events, I have zero certificate in events. <laughs> I have lots and lots of experience of the many mistakes that we did, of the many good things that we did, learned from them, and now work in partnership with people like you and consulting. If we are traveling somewhere, of course, the last time, on, if I want to travel to this place, what do I need to be able? And we've traveled with him. I think we've done two, two holidays with him. And yeah. all that experience now we'll bring to this student. But they are also lucky. We are in, the, we are in 2020 where they, they can go into their phones, they can go into their laptops and just Google what is happening. Even now I have my laptop here. I can Google something very quickly. But during our years, it was you test, you fall, you brush yourself up, you wake up, you learn from the experience, okay. so you don't do it again. So. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Simon, uh, over to you. How, how, how can we as an educational institution work together with, with, with Bonfire going forward? Uh, uh, thanks so much. Now, uh, there are some things that either especially hospitals must do, you guys inclusive. Uh, we are the employers in the market, and you guys are the supplier of those human resources that you supply to us. First, you need to give us COVID compliant uh, human resources. What does that mean? Right now, you guys need to add authority and train people on, on how to behave, how to act, how to re either to react and act, either before, during, and, and, and uh, after a pandemic. Mm. How do we across the board, either hospital, whichever, whichever place someone is in the hospitality, whether in the hotels, with airlines, all that uh, guides, all that, how do they behave during this COVID? Because it's just, as Chris said, it just takes one person to uh, overturn the equation. If, I see, for example, if one staff in my office, one of in all my offices is sick. It means all of us will get sick and vice versa. 
So I think we need people to have that attitude that this can change every situation and we need to have people who are COVID compliant, that is one. Secondly, as a, as a, as a trainer in hospitality, you guys need a, to be at the forefront uh, in, uh, in coming up with SOPs to be, with other stakeholders, SOPs to be followed uh, during this time and, and after and the measures which are on smart concepts that will be used uh, to gauge and, and measure, you know, on, on, on those measurable targets as far as the COVID is concerned. Again, you need to train, uh, maybe you need to train people who maybe understand now a lot of things apart from the normal hospitality. In addition to issues of health, issue of nutrition, I think now it should be a mixture of all that across the board. Uh, yes, Alan. All right, great. Thank you very much, Simon. So we've seen that yes, we 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 have to remain positive, and 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 the opportunity is still there. Okay, to bounce back, to bounce back after this pandemic, and 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 to work um, within within the industry and in our different sectors. Um, what what are the closing remarks you would have in terms of, uh, of, 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 of the people that we deal with, both clients and employees, okay, or, 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 or people working in the sector, on what to expect in the near future and also um, in the distant future? I'll start with you, Simon. Uh, as, as, a, as a, a closing remark, it's, it's good for everyone to understand that COVID is going nowhere in the nearest uh, future. We need to understand now that there will be the new normal that we need to live with. Uh, the issue is that how do, we, how do we live with the new normal? How do we make sure that this disease does not affect the person you love? How do you make sure that you are able to move on with whatever you do incorporating the COVID inside your life. What does that mean? You, you need to understand what the regulation, what, uh, what uh, the SOPs the government is, is giving, like sanitization, uh, like, um, uh, like uh, social distancing, all that, and wearing masks, among others. We have to embrace them and know that this, we are doing this for the betterment of all of us. It's better to be alive than be, uh, than be rich and dead. So that is very important and understand that uh, uh, some, uh, yes, people will be inconvenienced in a way, but good to understand that that inconvenience will, will, will be able to help to put you and people you love to be alive. Thanks, Alan. Great. Thank you very much, Simon. Over to you, Chris. Um, attitude change is the biggest, um, will be the biggest win. Um, as an agency, Kate Chris Limited, we, we pride ourselves as one of these event agencies that handle the events with safety and security in mind, as in those are their first items, because we know we are as good as our last event. So I always give an example of Sir Richard Branson. As much as he owns Virgin and many of those uh, planes of his, when he heads to Gatwick or London uh, Airport, I'm sure he is not skipped from the normal safety security that needs to happen. And if you look back probably 30 years ago, the safety, uh, the security checks that now exist in airlines didn't exist then. And there was a lot of hijackings and stuff like that. And obviously when they were introduced, people were very resistant to them. They were wondering, they were not happy. But right now, Simon will tell you, probably heading to Kisumu, you will need to head to that airport four hours in advance. Be able to go through fast, safety checks, and then security. When we come back to us, we need to lead by example. If I am the event organizer, if it's you um, uh, heading uh, B, B, A, H, uh, B, uh, BOMA, BOMA, yeah. Let's say you're leading that team in this event. Uh, Simon is leading his team that came. We need to be the first ones to be seen to be complying and actually complying with this measure so that the people we are leading see that we are taking it uh, very seriously. 
when we guys do an event, I always make sure and I tell my guys, I do not want anybody passing the security checks, including myself, including clients, unless they've been checked. And the reason we do this is simple. If somebody realizes that me, who has put up these safety and security measures, is not actually going through them, what is stopping them from using me as a carrier, either they will have smeared, you know, people, you know, it can also be malicious. It can, somebody can decide now, uh, let, let me infect the entire of this event because these guys are never checked. They never go through sure. the sanitization uh, systems that are in place and their cars are never checked. So I can actually plant an IED and I go and blow up the event. So when you think from that perspective, it means attitude change has to apply to everybody. And we know the safety uh, protocols, the standard operating procedures that are put in place are meant for us to keep us safe. <laughs> like someone has said, there is no need for you to be rich and dead. Yes. Um, as Kate Chris, what we are doing right now, because the events are not happening, we are, because we have a whole lot wealth of experience. So we are going around and we had started doing um, a review of event venues and we showcase the very best that we have in this country and our YouTube channel is called Event Venues KE. And the reason why we are doing that is to say, listen, Kenya is safe. Kenya is safe to tour. Kenya is safe to host everything. And we all need to work together. We, there is no way. And let's stop resisting what the government is saying. Let's just agree. We, we were able to survive the terror attacks and still continue doing events. We need to survive this too. Great, thank you. One last question that I, I, I received here from one of our viewers. Um, Mercy Kagiri is asking, and this is directed to you, Simon. Uh, in terms of technology, okay, now that the wildebeest migration is, is coming up very soon, will we, or, or do we expect to, to be viewing it from, uh, from, from our laptops? Are you going to set up some, some, uh, some webcams in Masai Mara to watch the migration? Yes, yes, uh, we hope so. We hope to do that. We are working on that uh, and, and coordinating with, with, with the relevant authorities to be able to see whether we are able to, uh, to give people the, that uh, spectacular scenery. Yes, there's so, many, there's so much that... Uh, that that uh, we are changing as far as the technology is concerned. So you'll be seeing the same case you are seeing too much of us. Uh, it will continue being the leaders in this industry and you see too much of us. Yes, there's so much that you'll be able to see. And now uh, we are still trying to, uh, to understand uh, what is happening. You know, right now, first, uh, after this disease came, we started having the, there was a, there was a, a panic mode and, people not knowing what to do, too much information. You don't know uh, what is real, what is true, what is not true. You could hear this now. Before, now is the time now we are going to the phase of filtering and get to know this is the true information and, up, uh, and um, accepting that this thing is, this pandemic is here to stay. We don't know for how long. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we understand how do we live with it and how do we make sure that uh, even if we are inconvenienced, our life has to go on at least near the normal, near, near, near the new normal or near the normality. So yes, uh, yes, uh, I know the, the migration will be happening. So we will still bring something to our client, Alan. Right, great, thank you very much, Chris. So uh, to all our viewers, in summary, we, we have heard from, uh, from, from, from Mr. Mr. Chris Kirwa and Mr. Simon Kabu. Uh, Simon says we all need to brace ourselves for the new normal, okay? Uh, there might be some inconveniences, but it's better to be alive and inconvenienced than rich and dead. And Chris, uh, your summary is uh, attitude is, uh, or attitude change is the key uh, to look forward. So I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Simon uh, Kabu from Bonfire Adventures and also Chris Kirwa from, from, from Kate Chris Limited. And from me uh, at, at BIHC, I thank you very much for, for joining in. Um, remember, intakes are ongoing right now for, uh, for, 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 for September, and we'll be looking forward to another episode of Utopia of Hospitality next week. Thank you very much for joining in. Huh? Have a great day.
Thank you.